We're going to talk about some of our work that we've done in the governance of emerging technologies uh, research program, in particular our most recent work that is looking at fairness and bias in AI, and in particular why in a European context we think um, it can't be automated, or at least not automated easily. Um, but Sandra, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is the, the program. Um, so it's myself, Sandra, Chris Russell, uh, we're leading it. We, we uh, represent three different disciplines. So Sandra is obviously a lawyer, a legal scholar, I'm a philosopher, a data ethicist, and Chris is a computer vision and machine learning expert. Um, and we also have a couple other people working with us. So we have uh, Johan Lau, who's a lawyer as well, and Sylvia Milano, who's also a philosopher. Um, and basically within the, the Governance of Emerging Technologies program, what we do is look at how to design, deploy, and govern new technologies that pose novel challenges across those three disciplines, so across law, philosophy, computer science. Um, and essentially our work is structured around the crossroads of those three disciplines, so it's fundamentally interdisciplinary. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the way that we tend to approach uh, the challenges of new technologies is by thinking about three things. Um, so first we think about what is actually legally required in terms of how the technology should be governed and designed. Um, the second is, based on what is legally required, is that enough or is there more that we would want? So what would actually be ethically desirable going beyond what the law actually requires? And then finally, we think about how we can make solutions to make these technologies better or more responsible or more trustworthy, more ethical, um, that are actually technically feasible. So we want to get the legal element, the ethical element, and the technical element essentially working together so that the three disciplines are not uh, talking past each other. And in our prior work, um, we have a number of themes that we've covered. So we've done quite a bit of work around accountability and explainability. Um, we've also done some work on inferential analytics and data protection law. And then our most recent work is on bias and fairness. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. And just to cover some of our previous work quickly, so probably our best uh, known piece of work is around explanations. So we had a paper first off where we were essentially analyzing the problem um, of the black box problem essentially in the space of AI, looking at what would uh, be the requirements for a good explanation. Um, and then our next paper on the next slide um, was proposing a method to actually compute these sorts of good explanations, these types of explanations that are meaningful to individuals that are actually being affected by uh, black box decisions or automated technology. So the name of our, our approach that uh, we propose is counterfactual explanations. Okay, and next slide. Um, so today we're talking about fairness, bias, and AI. But the question of course is why do we care about fairness and AI? Um, well, there's a number of reasons to care about it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm just gonna present two two cases quickly to give you a taste of the sorts of problems that we're interested in, the sorts of problems that motivate us um, as a research program. So this is a case from 2020. Uh, it's essentially a story about bias in AI and healthcare, um, where bias in the training data could lead to serious health risks for certain users, in this case, women. Um, so in this particular case, it's looking at a health app that's used to diagnose patients and give recommendations. And the worry is that if you have bias in the training data, it can lead to very different recommendations based on the gender um, of the user. So for example, over many decades, cardiovascular diseases were thought to predominantly affect men. Um, if apps are trained on historical data, which would mainly be collected from men, um, then the app may suggest to a female user that say her symptoms of pain in her left arm and, and her back, um, which in a male patient might be taken to indicate a heart attack, could instead be due to depression. And in that case, the app could then advise uh, the user to see a doctor in a couple of days rather than to seek immediate care, which would otherwise uh, be recommended. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second case I want to talk about is very, very well known one uh, now, especially uh, given recent events uh, concerning bias and facial recognition technologies and the negative effects that are experienced disproportionately by people of color. Um, in 2018, a civil liberties group used Amazon's facial recognition software to compare photos of all federal lawmakers in the U.S. against a database of 25,000 publicly available mugshots. Um, in the test, the Amazon system incorrectly matched 28 members of Congress with people who had been arrested, which amounted to roughly a 5% error rate among legislators. 
Now, what was interesting is the test disproportionately misidentified African American and Latino members of Congress as people in the, in the 25,000 mugshots. Um, it's concerning because Amazon's facial recognition software is being used by some police departments and other organizations. Of course, now they're implementing a one-year moratorium on sales to law enforcement, um, but it remains really to be seen what will, be ha what will happen after that 12-month period and if we're seeing increased usage of face facial recognition, um, just exactly how these sorts of problems arising from bias um, will will be dealt with, will be investigated, and ultimately uh, fixed or otherwise within the systems. Um, and so I will turn over to Sandra for the next part. Oh, Sandra, we can't hear yes. you. Yes, is it okay now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for, for the introduction. I'm gonna take over now and actually talk about the work that, that we have been doing to, to address those critical problems that, that Brent uh, mentioned and the, um, the the talk is centered around uh, two pieces of work related to that. One is the paper that um, Brent and Chris um, we just published uh, yeah last month or a month ago or so, uh, which is called "Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated: um, Bridging the Gap Between EU Non-Discrimination Law and AI." Um, it's public available on SSRN. Um, you can download it for free if you want to take a peek and dive deeper into into what we have written there, um, because I'm not gonna have the time to talk about everything, but just to give you some of the highlights. Um, talk is also centered around another piece that I wrote earlier that year, um, that focused also on non-discrimination law and especially on online behavioral advertisement and it's called Affinity Profiling and Discrimination by Association in Online Behavioral Advertisement. So um, same question, uh, how bias can arise when we talk about online behavioral advertisement and what kind of uh, consequences that could have for an individual and what kind of things are important from a legal perspective. So again, that paper is also publicly available. If you want to um, take a look, you can just go to SSRN and download it there. Um, just to give you a primer on um, non-discrimination law, um, I, I'm gonna keep it very brief um, because I assume, uh, yeah, to deep into the uh, specific a bit later on. Um, to talk intelligently about that problem, we first have to think about what the law actually requires when it comes to bias and discrimination. And so roughly the law wants to prevent two, type, two types of discrimination, direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. And direct discrimination means that somebody is treated less favorably based on a protected attribute that they possess. So for example, I could say, I'm um, not getting a job because you're a woman. That will be direct discrimination. I'm using a protected attribute like sex, and I'm telling you, you're not getting a job because of it. And that would be illegal in most cases. It doesn't happen too often in practice because usually people wouldn't tell you to your face that's what they're doing. Um, more likely to happen is something what's called indirect discrimination. Um, that will be the focus on that talk because it has a lot of implication for machine learning in general. So indirect discrimination works in a way that it uses a seemingly neutral provision quite during a practice um, that is applied to everybody. Um, and it just so happens that it disadvantages a certain group, a protected group um, more than others. Um, the provision doesn't actually relate to any protected attributes. So rather than using gender or sex to, to um, say that somebody shouldn't get a job, you would take something that looks on the face neutral. So you could say, for example, I'm only gonna hire people that are taller than two meters, or I'm go only gonna hire people that have short hair. And you will immediately understand that this will have a disparate impact, um, negative impact on, for example, at least women. Um, because you know that on average women will have longer hair and gonna be shorter. So it looks neutral, but it could actually have um, negative consequences for certain groups. So those are the two types of non-discrimination that we're dealing with. Um, that is you know, how the law is protecting us for um, against certain things. The problem is that um, when you use algorithms to make decisions as opposed to humans, the tools that we have created to deter discrimination are not easily translatable to um, AI. And I want to talk about two examples that show that we really need to figure out how we can make the law work in the future, because I don't think that the discrimination law is actually um, well equipped to guard against those things. 
Um, as I said, just just talk about an an, an online an, an off offline case how discrimination would work. You would, for example, feel that you're being discriminated, and then you would need to bring evidence. The problem is the way that algorithms are making decisions and how they discriminate is much more subtle um, and intangible and difficult to understand and unintuitive than humans would do that. Humans behave in a certain way. They have stereotypes. They have pre-existing notions of how they see the world, implicit, explicit bias, and they translate that into um, how they act. The, the thing will be that you would know that you feel something is off, right? You would see other people being promoted over your head. You would see that somebody's treating you worse than others. You feel that something is off, um, but that doesn't necessarily happen when algorithms are making decisions. So all the tools or the legal tools that we have to investigate, prevent and punish discrimination are might not good enough when it comes to, when it comes to algorithms. So, as I said, usually you would find um, that something is off. With algorithms, you don't actually know that. Somebody could tell you in a job interview you're not getting a job because you're a woman, or they could tell you that um, you're not getting a raise because you're a woman. They could also create such a toxic working environment that you feel that you're never going to be able to succeed. The point is that you will see that something is unfair and you raise a claim. The problem is that with algorithms, you might not actually know that you're currently being assessed. You don't actually know that you're being filtered out. You don't actually know that you're losing out on certain opportunities because you never actually have that interaction. So to give you an, um, an, an example, um, you know, usually uh, when you see a job advertisement, you will be able to see, for example, in a newspaper, you, you see it and you apply for it. Now, if you use, for example, search engines, search engines can be able to infer very sensitive details about you before you actually find the results. So an algorithm will be able to infer, let's say, your sexual orientation, um, your ethnicity, your gender, and then you start looking for a job, and the thing that you find is nothing. So rather than actually feeling that somebody is disadvantaging you, you actually don't know that you have been filtered out and you will never bring a claim. So all the tools that we have to bring evidence and to bring a case in court won't be useless, will be useless because you don't actually know that something's gone wrong. And this is not just for job advertisement. This is basically for everything that happens in the online world. Everything that you see online is tailored to you, is catered to you. It's a version that is just for you. It's designed for you rather than the actual truth. Um, so that means whatever you search on Google or on Bing is being tailored to you and the tweets that you see on Twitter and the posts you see on Facebook, everything is tailored to you. It is not the absolute truth and you don't actually know um, what the whole picture is and whether you're seeing something different that is discriminatory or not. Price discrimination, you know, another a very important example that could be problematic in the future when we increasingly get our goods and services online so traditionally, you would go to a shop, right? You would go to a shop, and if you're lucky enough and they still have toilet paper, you will be able to compare the prices of the product, and you would take the product that has the best um, uh, value for, um, for, for, for the price. In the online world, you see one price, and you don't actually know if you're getting a better or worse price than somebody else. And if you don't know that, you don't actually know if somebody is disadvantaging you. So rather than seeing a full picture of what's actually available and what the prices are, you running around with blinders. So you actually only see one version of the truth um, and that is actually problematic. So you're never gonna know, you're constantly being assessed, you're constantly being evaluated, you're constantly grouped in a certain way. Um, you might lose out on things, but you don't actually know um, that you're using out and therefore the law is not necessarily equipped to help you because you know it has a human perpetrator in mind rather than an algorithm. But let's just say that you actually figure out that an algorithm has been disadvantaging you. You figure out that you have been unfairly filtered out. The next step that you would need to do in court is to bring evidence and show that, for example, um, here, to go back to that, that the neutral provision criteria in your practice has disadvantaged you. So that means that the algorithm, the process, the rule that the algorithm is following, or whatever criterion is being used to group or filter you, actually puts you at a disadvantage and puts you and the group that you belong to uh, at a disadvantage. And that's an evidential problem that you would usually 
uh, need to prove in court. Nothing new there other than the fact that it's always been very hard to do. And it seems to be that it's going to be even harder in the future. So usually when you would go to court and you would bring a case and say, I think, for example, my employer is being discriminating me because of the employment um, policies that they have or the hiring strategy or the uh, promotion strategy, whatever it might be, the courts would then go and look at the case and say, is what you're showing me, is the criteria and the practice that you're showing to me uh, likely to put a disadvantage on a protected group, for example, women or uh, based on ethnicity, sexual orientation, things like that. The way that courts would usually do that is very sensible. They would very often use intuition to do that. Um, they, and that makes sense, right? All of those cases are real life cases. Again, you have a human that has implicit or explicit bias and is acting in a human understandable way, in a way that makes sense in our social work and is doing certain things where you kind of understand, well, this could be an actual problem. So very often the judges will use common knowledge and obvious facts and convictions because the social inequality is quite apparent. And to give you a couple of examples to show how intuition plays played a role currently in the law for, for good reasons, um, those are actual cases from the Court of Justice. If I told you that an employer is banning headscarves, for example, in the workplace, you will immediately know that this could have an impact on uh, freedom of religion, right? I don't have to show you a lot of data. Um, I don't have to prove that in a very complicated data-driven way. You will immediately understand as a citizen of this global, of, of this planet, that banning headscarves could have an impact on religious freedom. Similarly, if there was a law or a policy in a company would say that social benefits are only going to be paid to married couples, you will immediately know that this could be a problem for same-sex couples and therefore could be discriminatory um, based on sexual orientation. Again, you don't need to, a lot of data to understand that. You understand it as, as a human um, and you know it from the past because it has happened there. Um, and similarly here, um, if an employer, for example, had a, a regulation or a practice in place that says, um, I'm only going to promote people that have short hair and long people with long hair um, are not getting promoted, you will immediately know that on average this will be a problem for women. Again, th there's not a lot of data needed to, to make that judgment call. This is how humans make decisions. This is how humans understand the world. If they are implicitly or explicitly biased, they will use um, certain things to try to um, discriminate against people, either on purpose or inadvertently. Now, again, with algorithms, this might actually change because algorithms are using very untraditional data sources where that logical connection between the data and the potential negative impact is not immediately apparent. So for example, do you know what your shopping behavior actually says about you? How does your food and your drink consumption relate back to a protected attribute? Or does it at all? How does your food relate back to, for example, gender or um, sexual orientation? Does it? Does it not? So how are you going to prove that if you don't have any statistical evidence that there is a correlation between that? What if an algorithm is using your um, Netflix history, the movies and the TV series that you're watching, what does that say about you? What does that reveal about you? Could that potentially reveal your sexual orientation or your ethnicity? Um, what would be the evidence base for that? Can you make that claim um, without actually having access to that data? Or is there a correlation at all? How would you know? You don't immediately have that connection there. And lastly here, um, your reading habits, the newspapers that you read um, or the books that you read, do they somehow reveal something sensitive about you? And does the fact that an algorithm is using your reading habits, could that have a negative impact on you as a member of a protected group? And those two things, the fact that you don't have the evidence to show um, that there's a correlation between whatever you're doing in your online life and you as a person, plus the fact that you might not actually know that you'll be discriminated against shows that non-discrimination law, even though it works okay when humans are um, interacting, it doesn't really work when um, a machine and a human are interacting because their motivations and their understanding and the way how they make decisions is completely different. And the law was designed to keep humans in check and it wasn't designed to keep algorithms in check. So 
that was a long winded way to bring it back either to Chris or Brendan. I'm not quite sure how the, the noise level is, but that was mainly the, the, the reason why we started to think about what can be done with those loopholes that are, of course, not the failing of the law and it's not the failing of technology. It's just how society has changed over time. And therefore, we, we need to think about creative solutions. Okay, uh, yeah, I will do this part. So imagine that this is Chris uh, giving you this part, because again, unfortunately, he, he can't talk right now because of the disruption. Um, so yeah, so now that we know what the problem is in terms of automating fairness uh, in, in Europe, uh, owing to the, how non-discrimination law is practiced, um, what solutions can we propose on the technical side to support the sort of existing way in which the law is applied? Um, so, Go to the next slide quickly. Oh yeah, we're good. Thank you. Um, so basically what we're arguing is that there's a couple of shifts that need to happen here. First off, the technical community should increasingly embrace the judiciary's interpretive flex flexibility and design tools that enable the sort of contextual equality that Sandra was describing. Um, the legal community, on the other hand, should draw inspiration from the technology community and their coherent and consistent approaches for measuring fairness and disparity. And we think that working together, they can create tools and procedures that enable consistent assessment of cases, but not consistent interpretation of cases of automated discrimination. So the idea here is that the technical community can support the legal community in developing consistent assessment procedures, but not necessarily uh, interpreting fairness or non-discrimination law or thresholds um, of disparity in the same way across different uh, member states and just across different cases. Uh, so next slide, please. So just to conclude, we're going to look at statistical tests that are implicit in current jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice uh, and member state courts. So generally speaking, two statistical tests have been used to test for the presence of implicit discrimination, uh, negative dominance and demographic disparity. In negative dominance, a policy is said to disproportionately disadvantage a group if they represent at least 50% of the uh, disadvantaged group and that they represent less than 50% of the advantaged group. Um, the second part of that is typically taken to be implicit and therefore uh, taken for granted. In contrast, uh, demographic disparity, a policy is thought to disproportionately impact a group if they form a greater proportion of the disadvantaged group than the advantaged group. So if you write these formulas down, we can see that negative dominance is basically inserting an additional 50% threshold into the test for demographic disparity. And that extra threshold is so strong that it makes it incredibly hard to demonstrate implicit discrimination for small groups. In fact, what we show in the paper is that the threshold is so counterproductive in that regard that defense lawyers can create defenses by intentionally shrinking the group size or the, the groups that are being compared. We refer to that approach as divide and conquer. So if you have a significantly disadvantaged group, if you can then divide that group into further subgroups that can get you below uh, that 50% threshold for negative dominance. So next slide, please. So what, what does this actually look like in practice? Um, so certain types of implicit discrimination are so obvious that the court just accepts them as true. So for example, not hiring men with beards would be seen as, it, as discriminating against uh, Sikh men where there would be a religious requirement uh, to have a beard. Um, however, negative dominance would be so strict that it would hide that discrimination. So if we ran the numbers, uh, we would find that Sikh men make up roughly 0.8% of the population in the UK, while 37% of men have some kind of facial hair in the UK. So clearly, no Sikh men will be in the uh, advantage group, but they would still only occupy 1.9% of the disadvantaged group if you put this rule into place. The problem there is that they would be well below that 50% threshold needed to get past uh, the, the, the threshold for negative dominance. So if you use negative dominance as the test, um, that practice of not hiring men with beards would be seen, would not be uh, seen as discriminatory. Uh, next, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, yeah, there we go, great. So, um, thankfully, the, the European Court of Justice has defined a gold standard for comparing groups. Um, so according to them, according to the case of Seymour Smith, they said the best approach to the comparison of statistics is, is to consider, on the one hand, the respective proportions of men in the workforce able to satisfy the requirements, um, and to compare that to the proportions as regards women in the workforce. 
numbers. So essentially the gold standard being proposed here is that the composition of both the disadvantaged and advantaged groups must be examined. In this case, uh, I was addressing a requirement that was introduced by employers that employees need to be in the job for at least two years uh, to be able to raise unfair dismissal claims with the UK Industrial Tribunal. To support their ruling in this case that the requirement did not constitute indirect discrimination on the basis of gender, the court cited statistics showing that 77.4% of men and 68.9% of women in the workforce were able to meet that two-year requirement, and thus it was not a significant disparity um, between the, the two groups. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there's a standard sort of defense uh, that you can find for indirect discrimination. And essentially, what we're, uh, what we're arguing in the paper is that if this defense, this type of defense is offered, we should actually hold people to it and test um, the, the case according to it. Um, so the, there's a couple examples of what this defense looks like here. So only people that earn over 40,000 pounds can repay a loan, um, and we only offer it to the people that earn that much. So that's why it looks like we're discriminating based on protective characteristics, but actually we're not. Or certain genders are more likely to apply to certain academic departments, as those departments have different acceptance rates. It makes it appear that we're discriminating. So the, the basic idea is that um, if you're offering that defense that there's there's some sort of explanation for why what you're doing is not indirect discrimination, we should actually take you seriously and hold you to it. Um, all of the implicit discrimination should disappear when we look at or condition on the facts that you're saying are relevant, such as income that's greater than 40,000 pounds. Uh, next slide, please. So that approach need, leads us naturally to demographic disparity or conditional uh, demographic disparity, where the idea is you're, you're doing a demographic disparity uh, parity test, but you're conditioning on a preferred set of attributes. Measure, doing that sort of test comes with several problems. So the first is that the law is not concerned with whether something is statistically significant, but instead it needs to know how big an impact um, the, the thing, the rule, the practice is having, how many people it affects, and how badly. So if you have many subsets of people or of people that are affected, just by random chance, you're going to expect some of them to have significant disparity or large violations. Um, so you have to figure out some way to separate out sort of legitimate or real uh, sets of disparity versus just ones that you find by random chance. And second is that judges are uh, suspicious of statistics because they can result in a sort of battle of numbers where the side with the best statistics uh, wins. And so we should really have a test that's simple enough uh, that judges could roughly follow on the back of an envelope. So next slide, please. So fortunately, that sort of back of the envelope test uh, already exists and has been applied to this sort of problem for more than 20 years. So we can illustrate that by looking at a famous historical example of student admissions of men and women to Berkeley and the breakdown by department. And it, click forward once more. I think there's another table there. Thank you. Um, so we have a large amount of data coming in the top table, and we summarize it in the bo bottom table by running demographic parity tests per department um, and also overall. So you can clearly see that overall demographic parity is violated. Women form roughly 30% of the accepted group, but around 45% of the rejected group. However, the per department or per department, the message is much less clear because we have random fluctuations with women forming a greater proportion of the accepted group uh, than the rejected group in many departments. So to pull these numbers together, we use the standard approach uh, as proposed by Friedman and take the weighted average of these numbers across each department uh, with the weights given by the number of people that apply to each department. That approach naturally adjusts for the depart per department bias and gives us a single set of numbers that, that are comparable to those used in the tests for demographic disparity. So that reveals a much more balanced gender gap that is actually 2% in favor of women once departments are taken into account. So importantly, that 2% would be found to be statistically significant by most standard tests, but you can imagine that a court might well accept it as a su sufficiently small amount of bias. Okay, next slide. So last one. Um, so basically what we're proposing is conditional demographic parity as a type of math that matches up with the gold standard that the court has proposed. So the idea is it tells you this form of statistical test tells you where to look, um, but it doesn't tell you what to think. It can't tell you whether a legal disparity has occurred or whether it is justified. It can't tell you which group you're in, whether the disadvantage you, you suffered was severe or who your comparative group should actually be. Only the judiciary is is uh, 
it, only the judiciary should be assessing those matters. So rather, the summary statistics that report on conditional demographic disparity provide a sort of roadmap for further contextual investigation. It shows you the relationship between groups and an effect, affected population and how their size and outcomes compare. And therefore, it helps you answer these sorts of questions in a more holistic and statistically informed way. So essentially, the idea is we're proposing conditional demographic disparity to help remove the blinders of intuition that the court is relying on now and to warn you of dangers and forms of algorithmic discrimination that might otherwise go unnoticed. The next big question, if you adopt this approach, is how you decide which attributes to condition the test on, which, which is ultimately a normative question that is best answered locally on a national, regional, or even case-specific basis. Uh, next slide. So just to conclude, we've essentially covered what parts of AI fairness cannot and should not be automated, what parts of it can be automated, so consistent assessment procedures, and we propose conditional demographic disparity as a test to be used in Europe, at least uh, going forward, that respects the contextual equality that is built into non-discrimination law in the EU. So we'll end there, uh, and thank you very much for your attention.